owes a lot to Jim yeah. in her development, as well as a to James of players. Wade. Yeah. yeah, right. Would uh, you guys say Jim Pete was a better basketball player or a better analyst of the game? <sighs> I, I never, anything I never saw him play at the U. So. so I really decli- I declined to, to choose. <laughs> Did you, what was your answer, Pat? I never saw him play at the U, so I don't know. I mean, I he was a, he was a, basically he was a journeyman in the NBA. I did see him play in the NBA. We've we've occasionally have conversations about playing against the Celtics because I used to work in Boston and I covered the Bird Parish McHale Celtics in their declining years, and uh, he uh, <laughs> and we we've had some interesting talks about that. Uh, but he's a great analyst, and what I always like about him is that he's uh, he's honest. Yeah. You know, if there's something he can be critical without demeaning players. And I think that's very important because it's, it, you have to be honest with your audience. Your, on, your, your audience knows if you're making excuses right. and if you're lying. Yeah. Um, and Nothing then, worse than listening to an analyst that's a homer, you know. And, absolutely. And, uh, Which is like 90% of them these days. It's true. Yeah, it's true. S- some of them are charming. I, I think of Ron Santo when he was the analyst for the Cubs on radio and you could tell he was rooting for the Cubs, but you, but he would also rip the team if they did stuff that was yeah. just, you know, not great. Uh, and there, there are too many, it's unfortunately become an industry where there are too many analysts who feel like that to keep their job, they have to pull their punches. That's exactly right. And Jim, Jim just says what's on his mind and you know, God love him. That's why he's, he's such an interesting listen. And I know that, that, Cheryl, you and I have talked about this in the past, that I think that uh, serving on your staff kind of sharpened his, his analysis, in a sense, because now he saw it from a different side. And so now he's able to look at, from a, look at it from a coaching standpoint, knowing not only what goes into a particular, uh, a particular set or a particular defense or a particular style, but... Uh, what goes into it and, and why certain things work and why certain things don't, which I think is really helpful. Yeah, no, and, and he's talked about that, you know, made him a better analyst, you know, being on the coaching side of it, which makes sense. I think sometimes if you don't have that as a background, the coaching, and you're an analyst, um, maybe things are, are, I would say, when I say too simplified, um, that, you know, the, the coaches are asking the players to do certain things. They may not always do those things. Right. So yeah. if you have the background of knowing what goes into a preparation for a game, uh, schemes, what they're supposed to do in the schemes, then you can, you can not only be critical, but you can be really accurate in what you're talking about versus an analyst who has, doesn't have the coaching background. You have more of, um, you know, this sort of this, uh, what I would call this academia view of it, where there's a the real world and there's the academic, you know, academic world. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, I think that would, that would apply here, but I think Jim is, Jim is outstanding. And I, and I love that it's not easy to answer whether he was a better, better player or whether he was a better analyst, but, um, uh, he said he was great at both. That's what he told me. That was of course the he says that. Yeah, uh, we I, just, proof- I just don't want him chasing me because he can catch me. <laughs> uh, let's thank uh, Shelly Bean, the Sports Queen Sports Books, longtime sponsor of this program. Uh, girls' participation in sports and fitness is exploding, but the toys that girls play with and the books that they read don't represent that. Did you know that in the United States, less than one percent of children's picture books p- published annually have a female character who is phys- physically active? Shelley being the sports queen, sport, uh, sports books are changing that one book at a time, and they make the perfect gift at any time of the year for the child in your life. Follow along in Shelly being the sports queen. Learns a new sport. It's not easy for her, but she never gives up. And to reward herself at the end of each story, she makes a new sports charm for her crown. Use the tips at the end of each book to learn how to shoot a basketball or ice skate yourself. Meet her best friend Maya, her buddies Parisa and Mason, and don't forget her little dog Spike. To purchase your copies, go to Shelly Bean, the Sports Queen. I'm, I'm, I know I'm stumbling here. Uh, let me get. Let me make sure I get this part right. Shelly Bean, the Sports Queen. Dot com and enter the code links coach reeve to get 15 percent off the cover price check out the new five pack the shelly bean poster become a member of the fan club and much more again shelly bean the sports queen.com code links coach reeve uh, i have a new idea for shelly bean the sports queen. let's hear it um shelly bean the sports queen goes skating uh, because oliver needs a new book we went and ah. yesterday we had our first uh, venture at ice skating. So we went over to Lake of the Isles and we brought Ollie out there and, and, uh, I was not on skates. So I was not going to do that to him. Uh, so I was not on skates, but he was. And 
he he was good, but he he didn't like the uh, the fact that I always wanted to hold on to him. You know, because I'm worried, didn't have a helmet on. I'm worried every fall. You know, what's it? so I'm behind him. If you can imagine the parent behind the kid that starts to slip, and I'm got my hands out trying to catch. You well, know, I've heard wherever. of helicopter uh, parents. I've heard of a zamboni parent. Yeah, I'm. A, I'm definitely. I, I, I fit that bill. <laughs> the zamboni parent, and um, he did really well uh, for his first time. You know, for someone that didn't. I, wasn't able to teach him very much. Uh, next time we go out, we're going to have somebody with a little more, little more expertise. But we had one fall where he hit his bottom pretty hard, and he looked up at me. He said, "I want to go home. I want to go play superheroes at home." So he he was done. But we had we had a great day. So, but if you have Shelly being the Sports Queen book that you tell each time you fall, you get up, and and you know we can be able to um, maybe read that to him and give him incentive to to try it again. Well, I know Shelly, the uh, author, listens to this show, so now she has an idea. She, last time I talked to her, she was in Hawaii, so when she gets back, she can get, <laughs> she can get working on that. Uh, you two were talking br- briefly about free agency before we started the podcast. Uh, let's not get too granular about it all, but just give us an overall picture of what you expect free agency to be. Well, um, active, mm-hmm. uh, probably the, the best word, you know, come from our uh, organization's uh, viewpoint in that, um, you know, while our league, and we mentioned this before, you know, free agency isn't typically with the the top players uh, because of the use of the core designation. Um, it, there's still, we feel like, a, a number of quality players uh, to be had, and, and we're going to be very, very active, and uh, that begins, um, you know, the 15th. So, you know, that, that'll be, you know, tomorrow, and, um, you know, we'll be... We'll, we'll be working hard at it. Um, we think we have a lot to sell. You know, not only, um, you know, great players to play with, but uh, we think we have a great organization. We've got a terrific fan base. We have the facilities that go with it. Um, I'm, I'm quite sure that when free agents get a look at us, uh, we'd be a difficult place to say no to. And uh, do you do anything? Well, I, you, this is one of those questions you're probably not going to give want to give away too much, but I have to ask anyway. Do you do anything special in your recruiting process? Do you do anything unusual? Um, no, I wouldn't say unusual. Uh, I, th- I think our league is, you know, um, it, it's a little bit difficult in that oftentimes you don't even have the players here to recruit them. Um, and it's so it's a remote process, um, you know. But, yeah, I probably wouldn't tell you if there was anything that, that we did. I mean, one thing, well, whatever the, the deadline is, at twelve, if it's, is it 12.01 here or 12.01 in Europe that you would be able to call somebody? Uh, 12.01 here. 1201. Um, you know, I, I, I actually uh, have a call in the league is at 1201 Eastern Time, which means mm-hmm. 1101 mm-hmm. <laughs> Central yeah. Standard. Uh, but essentially, it's, um, you know, I suspect it's January 15th where you are. Uh, so 1201 where, you know, that, that team is. So, um, yeah. And like I said, to, to, you know, with, with a lot of the players being abroad, uh, you can get some real work done uh, at 1201. Yeah. And you can, <coughs> excuse me, but uh, you'll get input perhaps from some of your veteran players who could might recommend somebody or who might maybe even do a little recruiting on your behalf? Well, more than anything, they just have so much knowledge that they've collected through the years. They know far more than uh, what most coaches do uh, in terms of, you know, things that we want to know beyond basketball. We, you know, we can watch a player play, but I want to know more about, you know, who they are and how they would be a fit for us and whether our players want to play with them or not. And, and so it's really more of a selection process than a recruiting process. And, you know, we rely, uh, as always, on our, our um, you know, a couple of veterans uh, very, very heavily and, and for sure will throughout this process. And the no knuckleheads rule still applies, I presume? No. Um, you know, we we, re- we just retired the biggest knucklehead we had, uh, and so <laughs> it worked out fine for her. So we're going to be more open to the idea of knuckleheads. <laughs> Reminder, if you'd like to advertise with this podcast or the networking, reach the Talk North podcast at gmail.com. Pat, like myself, has covered pretty much everything. You know, we both covered Major League Baseball, football, whatever else, and we both have taken uh, great interest in the link success in the WNBA. So, Pat, just give me your veteran perspective on the league, where it stands, and where you might think it might be headed. Well, the league is... Um I think it's getting more popular, too, particularly among a demographic, uh, particularly among young men um, that uh, maybe might not have given this this league a second look even 10, even five years ago. Um, I, I, I tell people this all the time and that you television doesn't really do this league justice in that you don't really get a good enough sense of how physical the players are 
how talented they are, how fast they are, and the intensity of the game until you're actually in the building looking at it. And in fact, on TV, it actually looks slower than it is. Um, and uh, you really, and I don't think I've come across anybody yet who's come to a game and seen the Lynx play and then walked away saying, ah, this stinks, I'm not coming back to this. You know, and it's amazing how many particularly how many professional male professional athletes will come here and will be hooked and it's not just here you know all around the league so i think the league's in a, in a, is in a good place i'm really interested to see how the uh the negotiations with the collective bargaining agreement go because as i'm sure a lot of your listeners already know that the uh, the players have opted out after after next season uh there's a uh, the players seem to think that there's more money in the pot than the owners would like to would like have, have let on. We'll find this out. Um, all I know is coming to a Lynx game is um, you'll you'll see a really good brand of basketball, and uh, I think that uh, I'm really interested to see. I think I told Cheryl this before too. Now that that Whalen's not playing, and that they're coming off a year where they didn't hang a banner. Um, how many people are going to stick this out? Because I think that's going to be the key to, to where this league stands. I mean, if you've if you've developed a strong enough fan base that they identify with the team rather than a particular player, then you really know you've made it. And that's that's the evolution of, of sports leagues. Uh, I think David Barry writes about this the best. In that, uh, in professional men's sports, players come and go, and, and you you know you you might buy a jersey of a player, but you know, they're gone in a year, you know, two years. And um, that's a big part for our league, as you said, that uh, it's about a, an allegiance to the team, loyalty to the team. And I think our fan base has demonstrated uh, to this point. I mean, obviously, Lindsay's been a big part of that success. But, um, you know, Lindsay retired and it's known that she's been retired. And, and uh, you know, our, our fans are, are sticking with us. Yeah, you know, you go to a Twins game. And if you look through the stands, you see jerseys of all these players who are no longer on the team. Yep. Because and some of them are hilarious. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there are guys like played two innings in 1992. Yep. Yeah. You go, why would you buy this guy's jerseys? But, you know, also you have fans that, that spend a lot of money for jerseys and aren't going to just keep buying jerseys That's right. you know, for every new player. You know, I'll be curious in, in, in five or ten years to come back to a game how many Simone and, and Whalen and, and uh, Brunson and Whalen, uh, I already said Whalen, and uh, Maya vintage jerseys. McCarville. That we see McCarville. Yeah, we see McCarville. Yeah. I, I, I am actually surprised I don't see more of those. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, part of our uh, evolution, I think, uh, is I think we're better in merchandising maybe than... Yeah, you know, the stuff's got to be available. Yeah, than, than which, the earlier years. Which is still years kind and, of an issue in some places. Yeah, no, it's it's a big time issue. And, and you know, we, we have so many, we have layered uh, issues and that's one we'd love to tackle. I think there's a missed business opportunity. I always say that. that it's not that I think there's going to be a financial windfall, uh, but there's certainly a market for people who want WMB merchandise and... We just have not figured that piece out. Um, I've always said this. I think when you are committed to something rather than just sort of mildly interested, uh, you know, you see results in it. And I think that's something if somebody really would get behind that. Uh, and we talk about, you know, different areas of revenue generation. You know, that that would be it. Like I said, I don't think that, you know, there's a financial windfall, but at least it's something. There's a, there's you, know, you would be able to add to your your revenue stream and, you know, doing things like, you know, the, the special uh, city edition jerseys that – Fans would buy those things, maybe more so than you know than the the regular jersey, so to speak. If all of a sudden we did a Prince edition, um, I, you know, people are telling me they'd buy that, and you know, I think we're we're going to miss an opportunity uh, uh, with those sort of things. And you know, five years down the line, you guys do an old timers game. You're going to play. <laughs> I, w- I would think somebody like McCarville, somebody like Whalen, you know, somebody like Taj, if she's not coaching somewhere, you know, I would even think if that, she was coaching, Taj would play. Yeah, well then. You know, I think that I think people would absolutely spend that money would be on fun. That. that would be fun. Maybe in conjunction with an All Star game. Yeah, maybe we'll have our version of what? What's that? What's that league called with the older players that that you know oh, still get up and down the three, on, the three. On, oh no, the, the the three on three league that the NBA has. Is it the big has. three? Is it possibly yeah, the big three? three? Yeah. yeah, I think I, I yeah. think I read something. I didn't. That I didn't. was way more popular than I thought it would be. Yeah, well, anything that men do, people are going to get behind in sports. So, <laughs> so don't be surprised I by that. I can't really argue with that. Can I? Yeah, you might be able to talk McCarville into playing three on three. I think she absolutely would. She's still playing. I mean, so she'd actually she's she's in shape, and and uh, you know I think would uh, would absolutely play in a you know in a league like that. You guys still have her rights? 
Uh, she's an unrestricted free agent, she, so she could actually. You know, I don't. I don't no, we don't have her rights because we would be dealing with those contractually. Uh, she's an unrestricted free agent. Could play wherever she wants to play. Hmm. All right, I'm gonna come to you guys. 